We've asked David Abel, who is the environment reporter at the Boston Globe, um, to sort of sum up the day a little bit and give some thoughts of his own. Um, David, come on up. Um, I've known David for a long time. Um, he's been traveled the world covering many, many different events, um, everything from the Boston Marathon to the environment to the homeless population, and welcome. Thank you. Can I shut this? Thank you, I'll try to be brief. Um, so I've been a reporter in this town for uh, a good number of years and had the honor of uh, getting to know the mayor pretty well and speaking to him quite a lot over the years. Uh, as many of you might know, it was something of a daunting experience talking to him, uh, especially over the phone, because it wasn't always uh, easy to understand everything he said. So when he asked me to speak today, I, I wasn't really exactly sure what he was asking me to do. Uh, it didn't become clear until this week that he was really, in many ways, turning the tables on me and putting me in the hot seat. Uh, because he's basically asking me to come here at, without any slides or any presentation, but to try my best to uh, boil down exactly what everybody has been telling you all day. So I've furiously taken some notes, and, um, and I came up uh, with this capsule of uh, what at least I have uh, taken away from, uh, from what everyone has said. Here's what I wrote. We are burning way too many fossil fuels, which are releasing unprecedented amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, which is being trapped mainly by the oceans, and as a result, melting glaciers, most dangerously, most dangerously on Greenland and Antarctica, expanding the oceans and increasing sea levels. All that is ultimately inundating our coasts and making storm surges much more dangerous. The, the answer to the impending doom we either need to adapt, move inland, or die, <laughs> including the people in this very august building. Uh, okay, so here are some of the uh, some of the nuggets that I took away from what uh, what we've heard today. In terms of expense, Boston is the eighth most at-risk city in the world and the fourth most at-risk in the United States, after New York, Miami, and New Orleans. As Brian Sweat said, the city's environmental chief, uh, I usually like being in the top five, but not on this list. That means about five billion of residential property and 14 billion of commercial property is at risk. And that's not including the transportation infrastructure, as Jason Hellendrung of Sasaki Associates told us, excuse me for masquering your name. Uh, unlike, however, the beautiful images that he and his partners produced and was presented as something of a fait accompli in, uh, on the front page of my newspaper, the Boston Globe, it's unlikely that the mitigation strategy will take the form of winding canals in the back bay, as uh, Brian Sweat also reassured us. Another possibility to uh, avoid all of the uh, water that could flood into the back bay might be for Boston to build a multi-billion dollar system of James Bond style sea barriers like Giovanni uh, Sicconi of Venice showed us and that Bud Riss of the New England Aquarium suggested we should uh, give a lot of consideration to. Uh, if you're a reader of the Globe, I vow to do my best to persuade my editors that I should investigate this possibility by taking a trip to Venice. Giovanni has uh, <laughs> offered very kindly to be my host. Uh, as he told us, we should advance against nature, not retreat. But that might not really be a viable plan because another thing we learned is that Boston, in fact, the entire East Coast, is actually sinking. We have apparently sunk five inches in the past century, and to me that doesn't sound very good. We also learned that it might also be worth a trip to investigate all the porous asphalt and stormwater storage containers in Melbourne, Australia, which Councillor Aaron Wood kindly informed us was recently voted the fourth most livable city in the world. 
Uh, that's even though the prime minister of his country has called climate science crap and that coal is good for humanity. Uh, that said, we learned from Mayor Christian Bulwage of, of Elizabeth, New Jersey, that scientists were wrong to call what we've been talking about today global warming. Uh, we should stick with climate change, he and many of the other panelists said, because that's real for everyone. And as far as dealing with climate spec skeptics, an effective rejoinder we learned from Professor Anthony Janitos was this quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson. The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe it. <laughs> As evidence, in, in addition to rising temperatures since the 19th century, uh, Janitos cited thinner and declining amounts of Arctic sea ice, historic droughts, extreme weather, and sea levels that have risen, that, that have risen nearly one foot over the past century. We are reaping what we sow, he said. There's no place around the world now where impacts from current and future change are, are absent. He also said, we're seeing impacts today that 15 years ago we'd say would have been 50 years out. As scientists, it's a lesson in humility. As a citizen, it's an issue of great concern. Another piece of evidence of climate change, something that we can really feel here in New England, especially this week, uh, was cited by our moderator and my hero, Beth Daly. All you have to do is look at what's happening to Atlantic cod, she said. For what it's worth, cod in the Gulf of Maine, which studies have shown is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans, have fallen to about 3% of what would sustain a, a healthy population of cod. It's gotten so bad that NOAA this week effectively banned fishing for cod in all of the region's waters for, the next, for at least the next six months. We also learned that one third of global sea rise is the result of all, carb all the carbon dioxide now being st stored in the world's oceans, as Josh Willis of the California Institute of Technology told us. The resulting warming and expansion of the oceans are likely to lead to more widespread, frequent, and disruptive coastal flooding in cities across the country, as Erica Spanger Siegfried of the Union of Concerned Scientists told us. Compounding that problem we saw came in a slide presented by Scott Doney of the, World, uh, of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It showed that intense precipitation is likely to increase more than 70% in the coming years. He also told us how the problems of sea rise are contributing to the increasing acidification of the sea, which are harming all manner of plants and animals. Being bombarded by all this information might be enough to drive us back to what life was like in the Middle Ages when folks went around, quote, mildly drunk because they were afraid of water that lacked alcohol, as Judge Stearns uh, shared with us. In the end, perhaps, though, Bud Riss summed it up, uh, summed up the purpose of this gathering the best when he said, past projections have become reality, and if we don't stick with mitigation, we're going to have a really big, a, a really big problem. And finally, I just want to say a word to Andrew Rosenberg of the Union of Concerned Scientists, who uh, was concerned about getting the message of climate science to reporters. Uh, wherever you are, uh, I just want you to know I've sat through it all, and I've and I've heard it, uh, and I think like most of the folks who have been here, uh, I think we've all learned a lot. Uh, most of all, I think we have Mayor Menino to thank for that. So with that, thank you very much.